Tonight my sermon is on, What Must I Do to Be Saved? Here's some things you need to understand in order to be saved. God created everything. He made everything out of nothing. He spoke everything into existence. God said, let there be light, and there was light in Genesis 1, 3. God's word has always been powerful. God's words are in the Bible. If we obey them, we will go to heaven. There is only one God, but there are three persons in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Salvation is possible through God the Father and giving his Son. John 3.16, we all know this verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 1 John 4, 8 and 9. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In forgiving, Isaiah 38, 17. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitter bitterness, but you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. God the Son, John 10, 11, 17, through eight, 17 and 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life that I might, may take it again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God the Holy Spirit. Through the power of the word of God, we are saved. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. In James 1.21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Obedience to the gospel, only those who obey will be saved. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the, doing, by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Revelation 22:14. 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Romans 1, 16, as we already said before, and Acts 2.40, and with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Those who fail to obey will be lost. And Carlos quoted this verse this morning, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. And to give you who are troubled to rest with us when the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. 1 Peter 4, 17, 18. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? What we must do to obey, first we must have faith. Hebrews 11:6, God says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This faith comes by hearing God's word, Romans 10:17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But the question is, is faith enough? No. It is a foundation of being saved, but it is not 
in and of itself a guarantee of a safe condition. The Bible speaks of many who believed in Jesus, but were obviously not saved. In John 12, 42, the Bible says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. James 2, 19 says, You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. And James 2, 20 and 24 says, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. James here speaks not of meritorious works that would earn salvation, but rather works of obedience. Faith, therefore, without obedience is not enough for a person to be saved. Next we have repentance. Luke 24, 46 and 47. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary, for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Acts 17, 30, 31. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. In Luke 13, Jesus spoke about many who had been killed, though not necessarily because of sin. But then he said in verse 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. To repent is to look at your actions after the fact and then have a change of mind and then a change of action or direction. In Acts chapter 2, Peter declared that the Jews were responsible for crucifying the Messiah, the Son of God. They were cut to the heart and asked, what shall we do? Peter told them in verse 38 that they needed to repent. He also said though, to those gathered at the temple in Acts 3.19, repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And again in Acts 17.30, Paul told those at Mars, Mars Hill in Athens, truly those times, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Confession before of Jesus as the Son of God is also required. Romans 10.10, 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Then in Acts 8, 37, then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Baptism is also required. Mark 16, 15 and 16. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. In Acts 2.38, then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There are numerous places in the New Testament that refer to baptism. In Matthew 28.19, Jesus commanded his disciples to go and baptize all nations. In Acts 2.38, as already mentioned, after the people asked what they needed to do, Peter said, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Verse 41 says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. In Acts 22:16, Ananias told Saul, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The Bible teaches that salvation is only through Christ, the Son of God. John 14, 6 and 1 John 5, 11 through 13. It also teaches that we put on Christ through baptism. In Galatians 3, 27, Paul said, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Paul reminds Christians in Romans 6, 3 and 4, 
Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. He says that just as Christ died, was buried, and was raised again, so also we, through baptism, are raised to walk in newness of life. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it teaches the same thing. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greek, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. And 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21 says, who were formerly disobedient, when once the divine suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few souls, that is eight, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the res resurrection of Jesus Christ. The question becomes, when were they saved in Acts chapter 2? Acts 2 is one of the most fascinating chapters in the Bible. It records the events of the day of Pentecost just a few weeks after the crucifixion of Jesus. As John the Baptist and Jesus both had promised, Matthew 3.11 and Acts 1.5, the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit and were given the miraculous ability to speak in languages they had not previously known. Peter then proceeds to preach one of the greatest sermons of all time to the thousands who had gathered there in Jerusalem. Peter concludes his sermon with these words in Acts 2.36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Peter's sermon accomplished its purpose as we see the people cut to the heart and asking him and the other apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They believed what Peter had said in his sermon and they were convinced and convicted of their sin of rejecting and killing Jesus. Peter's response to them in Acts 2.38 2, was repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. At what point were they saved? They had listened to Peter and had come to believe that they had in fact crucified the Son of God. It was at this point that they believed Peter, but was that belief enough to save them? Apparently not, or else Peter would have answered the question by saying something like, there is nothing you need to do. You're already saved because of your belief. Go and try to live for Christ now. But that is not what Peter said. In verse 38, Peter first told them that they needed to repent. To repent means to turn around and change directions. For the people listening to Peter, it meant to turn away from their sin and their fight against Jesus, and they needed to turn to him and accept him in his way of life. Would then their faith coupled with repentance be all that was needed for salvation? No, because Peter also told them to be baptized for the remission of sins. In fact, it is clear that they were still, still not saved before baptism because in verse 40, Peter kept preaching, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. But then we come to verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And verse 47 goes on to say, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. At what point were they saved? It could not be much more clear than what it says in verse 41. They were baptized and then were added to the Lord's church. The Bible teaches that it was at the point of baptism that they came into a saved relationship with the Lord. Romans 10.10 10, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Acts 8.37 Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Some people claim that in Acts 2.21, when Peter said, And it shall come to pass 
that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved means that saying a prayer will save you. Does saying a prayer save you? Right after Peter made that statement that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, he preached the gospel in verses 22 through 36. And when the Jews were cut to the heart and asked Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? In verse 37, Peter told them how one calls on the name of the Lord. When he said in verse 38, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Peter cleared up any doubt on this matter when he told them in verse 40 to be saved from this perverse generation. Those who gladly received his word were baptized in Acts 2.41. And this is how one calls on the name of the Lord. This is also shown to be true in Acts 22.16 when Ananias told Saul, And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In other words, one submits to baptism in order to have forgiveness, and in knowing one sins are forgiven, a clear conscience. Obedience and faith is our appeal to God, in which God responds by forgiving sins and offering a cleansed conscience. This is done by the blood of Christ, Hebrews 9.14, and baptism is where Christ's blood is contacted. The blood of Christ cleanses our conscience, Hebrews 9, 14, since it is for the remission of sins, Matthew 26, 28. Baptism in water is the answer of a good conscience, 1 Peter 3, 21, since it is for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. Baptism saves because of its relation to the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is not a cleansing of the body. It is a cleansing of the soul. A cleansing of the conscience by the power of Christ's resurrection. Baptism is essential for salvation because God has ordained that our union with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is accomplished through baptism. When someone says that salvation is possible through faith in Christ without baptism, he is not speaking the truth because he therefore believes, uh, that, uh, he thereby proves that he does not believe Jesus Christ. For Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he does not believe what Jesus said. Once we have obeyed the gospel for the remission of our sins, we must remain faithful. We are to add certain characteristics to our lives. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 11, and Galatians 5, 22 through 25. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And we must continue in the work of the Lord. James 1, 21 through 25, and also Philippians 1, 27 says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. And we must remain faithful no matter what. Matthew 10, 22, And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. In Revelation 2, 10, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer, Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. But be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And in Revelation 3, 5, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. We must use our talents 
Our purpose is to glorify God. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and I like the, new, the King James Version here. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. In Acts 17, 27 and 28, so that, that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We are to use our ability to God's glory. 1 Peter 4.10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good steward, stewards of the manifold grace of God. And in 4, 1 Corinthians 4.2, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. And faith, failure to use our talents will cause us to be lost. And that's spelled out for us in Matthew 25. 14 through 30. But I want to observe especially verse 30. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And we must treat our brethren right. We are to love our brethren. Hebrews 13, 1. Let brotherly love continue. 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, for he who loves God must love his brother also. And this love will cause us to act in a certain way toward them. Matthew seven twelve. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and prophets. Galatians six ten. As we have opportunity, therefore, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. We will not gossip, backbite, nor do other things that will cause harm to our brethren. We must love God completely. We are to love God with our entire being. That's Matthew 22, 34 through 40, and Luke 10, 25 through 28. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And he answered and said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. And God must come first in our life. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And also in Revelation 2, 4 and 5. And in conclusion, if we are going to believe Jesus and believe in him, then we are going to have to believe his teachings. If we are going to believe Jesus Christ, then we have to believe it all. We can't pick and choose what we want to believe and what we don't want to believe. We can't accept Jesus as our Savior and King, but refuse His teachings. Jesus Christ Himself said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Then He went on to teach the parable of the foolish builder who failed to obey in Luke 6, 47-49, thus building his house on a sandy and uncertain future, but yet the wise builder, who because of his obedience, built his house on the rock. Do we believe Jesus' teaching about the wise and the foolish builders? If we reject Jesus' teaching, then we obviously do not believe him. How can we believe in Jesus, but not believe his teachings? We cannot believe what we want and reject the rest. It doesn't work that way. If we are going to believe in Jesus, then we must believe all of his instructions. In the account of the wise and foolish builders, as recorded by Matthew, Jesus introduced the parable by saying, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Matthew 7, 21. People who simply believe that Jesus is who he is will cry, Lord, Lord. They know who he is. They know what he did for us. They know and believe in him for who he is. But those who fail to obey him 
Believe in the man, but not in his teachings. Jesus taught in the parable of the wise and foolish builders that only who do his will will have their houses built on the rock. Jesus said that. Do you believe him? Do you believe he meant what he said in Matthew 7, 21? If you do not believe that, then you are guilty of unbelief. Jesus taught in John 3, 18, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Do you believe Jesus taught that? If anyone rejects this te teaching of Jesus, then they are guilty of unbelief. Jesus taught in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do you believe that we must confess Jesus before men in order to be confessed by Jesus uh, before God the Father? Do you believe that Jesus meant that when he said it? If you do, then you cannot believe in salvation by faith only, because faith only has no room for any act of obedience whatsoever. Salvation by faith is either salvation without nothing but faith or belief, or it isn't. There is no middle ground. Either, believe, either you believe Jesus requires the act of confession, or you don't. And if you don't believe confession is required, then you do not believe something Jesus taught, and are therefore guilty of unbelief. Jesus taught in Luke 13, 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Do you believe we must repent in order to be saved? Can we continue in our sinful lives and live without repentance and expect a home in heaven? If you believe we must repent, then salvation cannot be by faith only, because salvation by faith only has no room for action. Repenting is doing something. If we are saved by faith only, then we can be saved without repentance. Do you believe in Jesus' teaching that we must repent? If you do not, and you insist that our salvation is by faith only, then you do not believe something Jesus instructed and are therefore guilty of unbelief. Jesus taught in Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe everything he instructed? If you do believe Jesus, then you must believe that baptism is necessary in order to be saved. If you do not believe that baptism is necessary, then you fall into the second group of individuals mentioned by Jesus in Mark 16:16. 16, 16. Those who do not believe are under condemnation and will not be saved. We already know from Jesus' teaching on confession and repentance that salvation is not by faith only. Why would baptism be any different? If you are not baptized, then you do not believe and will be condemned. We cannot claim Jesus is our Savior and claim we believe in Him if we do not believe His instructions. If we do not believe in His instructions, then we do not believe Him. Those who do not believe Him either. verse for Mark 16, 16 is Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is a command. It is a divine instruction from the very words of Jesus Christ. The baptism here is a baptism that can be administered by man and the one that can be submitted to in obedience. Jesus commanded it. You must therefore ask yourself, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in what he taught? Do you believe Jesus? Jesus isn't done instructing us yet. Salvation is not by faith only. Salvation requires belief, repentance, confession, and baptism. That is not faith only. Faith only salvation, if it were true, would come without any above mentioned acts of obedience from the words of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus still has more instructions to give. We saw in Matthew 28, 19 that Jesus commanded baptism for every man on earth. He wasn't finished. He had another instruction on the heels of baptism. Jesus went on to say in verse 20, 
teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. If obedience is commanded, surely it is expected. When Jesus addressed the church in Smyrna in Revelation 2.10, he gave this instruction. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. If any Christian in, anywhere, in any church anywhere in the first century had to remain faithful unto death, then they all did. And if they did, we must be faithful unto death today. John taught that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. This is a conditional statement. Jesus began the verse with the word if. In a conditional statement, if the condition is not true, then the results will not be forthcoming. If we do not walk in the light, live faithfully, then there will be no fellowship with God. There will be no ongoing cleansing of sin by the blood of Christ. What this means is that salvation is not by faith or belief only. Faith saves, no doubt about it. Those who believe are saved, no doubt about it. But not until that faith or belief has resulted in obedience to God. Faith saves when and only when faith obeys. If there is anyone here who believes but has not obeyed, then they are not saved. By faith, the heroes in Hebrews chapter 11 obeyed and they received the blessings when they obeyed and not a moment before. <coughs> Excuse me. By faith, each and every one of you must hear. You must listen to the word of God. By faith, you must repent of your sins and turn to Christ. By faith, you must confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God before men. By faith, you must submit to baptism in, into Jesus Christ into the watery grave of baptism for the remission of your sins. And by faith, you must live an obedient, faithful life, walking in the light as Jesus walked, remaining faithful until our last accountable breath of life on earth. These instructions came directly from Jesus in John 12, 48, where he said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. If you do not believe these instructions, then you do not believe Jesus. Do you believe him? Do you believe in Jesus and what he said and what he taught? Do you really believe him? If you believe him, please come forward as we stand and sing this song of invitation. <laughs>